Hello, I'm Stefan Friedman and today I'd like to introduce you to a good friend who's also a therapist of mine um, and does some work that I find very valuable in the trauma field so I'm hoping this will be of interest. This is Jessica Clements. Hello, thank you Stefan. <laughs> Jess, thank you very much for coming up from London to Woodbridge today for this interview. Uh, it's really nice to be able to do a face-to-face -face interview. So I think it would be good to give people a brief overview of what the work that you're doing and then we'd like to dig in and see sort of really what led up to it, how, how did it all start. So um, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> a big question. Um, so uh, I think I have to start at the beginning okay. with me, with okay. uh, it will be my trauma. Mm. Uh, I, when I was nine and three quarters, I had a hemorrhagic stroke. I had brain hemorrhage and hydrocephalus, or water on the brain. I had two major brain uh, operations, and um, and subsequently, I have suffered from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I physically recovered fairly quickly. I was young, and my brain was very, as they said, plastic, and so that. Um, um, that recovery was, was quite fast. Since then, I, I went on a journey. Uh, and Can I just pause it, you? Yeah, I do. So, you, you have PTSD symptoms, not physically, but emotionally, mentally. Can you just give one or two examples of what were you struggling with? Um, it's taken me some time to work that out, but uh, as only recently, PTSD has only really begun to be investigated and recognised. So I have panic attacks, mm. and um, I dissociate, mm. and I can't think, <laughs> and gibberish comes out of my mouth, and I'm running around doing all sorts of things. I mean, that's an extreme version of it, but uh, so yes, when I get into a dentist's chair, I almost certainly have a, a panic attack there. Yeah, so the that sort of, that, that wiring still remains as something that comes up. But what's developed is your your ability to yeah. cope with it and to have a strategy to sort of not get stuck there. Yes, um, I haven't found a way of stopping having um, uh, panic attacks, but I have found quicker ways out of it. Yeah. And this is all because of the therapeutic t tools yeah. I've I found. And the primary one I use with with trauma is my animal totem, my elephant. Uh, the elephant of my heart, as I call it, and it comes from uh, Steve Gallegos's work, Deep Imagery, or the Personal Totem Pot Process. Can you give us a little story about that? Yes, so I met the Personal Totem Pot Process when I was in my late twenties, and I was invited by a friend of mine to have a session of Steve Gallegos's work. And I sat down and I had the most amazing 40 minutes. I was introduced to my elephant. But it wasn't the me as in the adult 29-year-old. It was the me as in the little 9-year-old, still in my hospital gear with my head bandaged. It was that part of me that was primarily on the journey. And my elephant took me to meet all of my other animals. And I have, oh, let me see if I can remember them. I have a um, phoenix at my brow. I have its fleas at my sacral chakra. I have a black panther at my heart. I have um, a, um, a goldfish at my root. And all of these animals taught me that the scars that crisscross my head can be seen in a different way because they're now sutured with a black panther's whisker and held by a dragonfly. And these images are so beautiful and they really gave me a new doorway into my trauma. They reframed it for me so that I can think, oh, well, I'm no longer as disabled as I thought I was. Perhaps I can use it in a different way. And it has subsequently been that way for me. Now my, my trauma is what I teach and what I, I um, do through the day. Yeah. So when you, you describe meeting animals, mm. for someone that hasn't been through that process, um, let's take a step back. There you are, and there's Stephen Gallegos, Gallegos and, and suddenly an elephant appears. Now where, where is he? <laughs> How did he get there? So it's all in, done in a meditative 
um, guys. So you are asked to close your eyes and then you begin to visualize. I'm very good at visualizing. Others are better at, at, at hearing. Others are very good at, at the sense of feeling, touch. Mm. And others have another sense that is just a knowing. Um, but it is using all of the sense and any other that you may have um, available to you to be able to explore this inner dimension that Stephen Gallegos calls aliveness. Mm. So I, I want to let you know if you're watching this video, there are two video there, were, there are two videos with Jess, and in this one I want to give some we, we want to give some understanding and background about this process, which I hope you might find useful. I am currently finding it very useful. And in the second one, I'm going to be Jess's guinea pig, and she will demo a session. Um, she'll because she is a therapist. She'll be the therapist. <laughs> and I'll be the one that might see an elephant or something else, we, sh we shall see what comes out. It's never, uh, it, I would never be spoon-fed what to see, uh, simply given the opportunity to see what comes up and what that presence wants to say to me. So um, that's, that's been really helpful. So to get from that point of working with your own different parts of your inner self that had previously not been necessarily connected or evident, to get from there to working with it therapeutically with other people. What, tell, tell me something about that journey. Well, it took me about 20 years um, until I joined Stephen Gallegos' um, course that he ran, he ran, and um, it was three years just going deeper within the um, within the learnings. He's a qualified um, uh, uh, psychotherapist, um, but he also um, understands many other different modalities. The um, Native American Indian understanding that animals also show spiritual. Um, uh, characteristics um, and then and just the whole process of the shamanic journey uh, going within and seeing what turns up mm. and going with that allowing and trusting whatever arrives and but also being able to say no I'm not sure about this I want to come out that is just mm. as valid um, as the, 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 the jump into it mm -hmm. yes. so when you, you mention the word spiritual and you mention the word shamanic and for some people viewing they may be very familiar and for some people they may sound a bit fanciful or out of their experience. So if an animal has a spiritual or shamanic quality or message, can you explain a little bit about that? Well from my belief they all have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it is the link between them and us. For example, dogs are always known as very loyal and within the shamanic tradition they are linked with loyalty. And so it's, it actually follows our own sort of common sense. Um, as you watch any animal and you, you see how they are, you go, oh my goodness, they are dot 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 dot, cat perhaps being independent. These are the generals. Mm. However, once you go within and you meet your animal, your animal might have a totally new understanding that they might want to teach you. And that is more valid than accepting the generalised um, society's understanding. Mm. Which is even more fascinating because this work is so individual. Yeah. Incredibly individual. And the thing is, is that your animals know where you are because they are part of you. And so they can guide you with such subtlety, such deference, such compassion to where you need to go. Mm. But also such fun. Mm. You really do settle within into such a place of loving compassion and, and um, trust that if they say, come, let's go and do something a little bit harder, you kind of go, uh, yeah, all right, and off you go, until you suddenly realise you're in a profoundly frightening place, or would have been profoundly frightening, had you not been in the crowd of these gorgeous animals who are just giggling and making you laugh and having such fun. Yeah. But you suddenly realise, oh, they've taken me outside my comfort zone. Mm. Oh, this is brilliant. But can I go home now? <laughs> and all of those reactions are absolutely valid. And I was taught also was to always keep returning back to our animals. 
always keep telling our animals how we are feeling, whether or not we want to go with them or whether or not we're not sure about that. Listening with the ears of our heart to whatever it is they say. Yeah. It's always though up to us whether or not we want to follow them or not. And it's valid if you want to move away, have a cup of tea, shake yourself yeah. out, <laughs> go watch a movie. Yes. They will always be there. It's like a digestion thing. You, yeah. you can monitor how much you can digest, yes, digest at, one at one time. And you might say, well, yeah. this is an amazing meal, but I'll come back to it tomorrow yes. or next week. Yeah. But I want to check something with you. Mm. Um, and also, to, it, it may or may not clarify things, but my understanding is that there are, there are various approaches to what is called parts work. Some people talk about um, meeting and supporting your inner child. Some people talk about um, the community of presences within, but don't necessarily refer to animals. Mm -hmm. We might be talking about my, um, my shame, mm -hmm. or my grief, or, my, or the protectors that, um, that jump in whenever I want to talk about or feel my emotions, and they say, no, it's not safe. And what I find special, why I'm drawn to the animal work that you've done with me, is that it takes it slightly outside that sort of almost clinical mm. feeling of um, um, let's let's have a word with your shame, shall we? Or you know, it's <laughs> yes. not really, it's never really that. Uh, uh, what's the word? Crass, but um, it could feel very highly charged and difficult, and. If I invite an animal to come forward that wants to speak to me, it, there's a, there's, to me there's a degree of safety and yes. a degree of obliqueness. It's, it's not like having to actually delve right into the wound, but somehow to stand by it with something in, in me that feels some strength. Sometimes, yes, no, absolutely. Um, I've worked with my shadow a lot within and you can just ask your shame to take on an animal form ah. or your guilt or for me when I first started doing this I was very very frightened mm. of anything <laughs> and so I asked my fear to take an animal form and this huge Alsatian dog literally jumping up from my jugular mouth open growling snarling and I went whoa <laughs> but I stayed where I was I don't know because I knew I was safe yeah and this animal, and I gave it time, and this animal began to calm. And as he began to calm, began to calm I realised who was standing behind him. And that was my little inner child. Mm. And I realised that I was being protected against me. There was my little inner child who was threatened by something I was asking it to do. Yeah. And so she sent a very large Alsatian dog to tell me no. <laughs> and now since then I have, I have journeyed a lot with my fear. And um, it is very profound, um, that work, because whenever you step into your shadow, you only have a torch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or the, the opening door with the light flooding through. And it takes courage to be able to step into that. And what would you say is the benefit of stepping into that space with the shadow? There is such gold within there. Because you have, there are two versions of your shadow. You have your black, nasty shadow, um, the murderers, the thieves and all of this. But you can also have your golden shadow. Your golden shadow being these parts of yourself that um, you see in others, the film star, the great speaker, the whoever, and you go, oh no, 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 I'd never I be able never. to do that, yeah. I could never do that, and you run underneath the table. Mm. That is your golden shadow. Mm. Because everything you're frightened of, you have within yourself mm. to be able to be, to do, to create. And these are the golden nuggets, these huge golden nuggets that are within your shadow, if you can find the the courage to go through, but the courage comes with the animals. Mm. When you're walking with a lion, or I sometimes walk with a dragon, huge great big thing, um, and these animals will be exactly the animals you need. And that's what I find so extraordinary about this inner work. 
you've done it for a, lo a long time, much longer than I have, and when you speak, I really get the sense that this is a community that live with you, inside you. You can sort of connect with them, access them, draw on their strength or wisdom when, when needed. Absolutely, I, I have my own inner totem pole, mm. and they're all there, mm. and it, it is my strength, it's like a tree. And I use trees within my visualization. I often start with trees. I like that. I, I start with growing roots out of my feet and then building this huge tree. And then you can choose what part of the tree you wish to be in, like way up in the branches, mm. moving with the wind, or solidly in the earth, yeah. in, the, in the roots. Yeah. And there at your heart, I take people to find the animals of their heart. Mm. And this is something I hope, um, this may, it may all seem very strange or new to some people watching, but I hope you can picture that this, when you're invited to embark on this process, it starts off with creating safety nice. and a feeling of being grounded and feeling having roots and relaxing, breathing, and picturing something very um, non-threatening, like a tree, and then very often a doorway or some kind of entrance. And then beyond that, we, there's the invitation to see who wants to meet you. And Jess often invites me to meet the animal of my heart, what, however that may manifest. And may I say also, Please. but you don't also have to see it. You mm. can also hear it, mm. touch it, um, taste it sometimes. Whenever you're at the sea, you can taste the salty air. So it's it's written about all of your senses. Yeah. I just didn't want anybody to put off because they hear the word see yes. and visualize. Yeah. That's just a part. And if these aren't things you find too easy, the more of this inner work you do, suddenly doors open and you can suddenly see things. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Just extraordinary. And you've invited, I've, I've done some work with Jess in groups, so I've been able to hear how other people, the feedback that they want to give as well as my own experience. And sometimes not much seems to be happening. Uh, you invite an animal to come in and there, nothing seems to be there and Jess will say, well, maybe put out your hand in your mind's eye, put out your hand and see if something touches it or sniffs it or comes to you that way. So there's various ways in. And once or twice when we've, when, when you challenged me a little bit more, like the most recent session, um, we agreed that I would meet the isolator in me. I wasn't totally sure what it meant and I didn't mind not knowing. It was just like, let's see what happens. And initially I couldn't see much. Um, but I just stayed with that almost a sense of reluctance to see it. Yeah. And it was as if something very gradually took shape. And when it did take shape, it held a lot of meaning. And another interesting thing is that the shape that it took transformed during the session and something that initially felt scary and unpleasant and ugly yeah. became something that was rather like a huge toy um, that, that I, it seemed rather unformed and I, I rather felt, I felt for it rather than felt threatened by it. So whatever it is in me that was formed maybe at a very younger age that seems very big and menacing can transform when it when it gets light and attention. Absolutely, and the isolator isn't easy to see because it is primarily isolating you sometimes from your eyes, your ears, your, your whole body sometimes. And that is its primary goal, to keep you hidden, safe, covered. Yeah. And what I saw was this, I, I saw myself in this cave it was a sort of cavernous place with this huge thing that was basically could hardly fit into it it was just bulging into every crevice and there wasn't much space for me um exactly and when we kind of invited it to speak and i realized what it was about it was protecting the very young me yes. from everything yes I just I protect yes. you from everything. Yes. So don't bother living no. because it's not safe. Yes. So Absolutely. we needed yes. a little negotiation with that. And then um, it's showing that part of you, that animal within you, how you've changed. Mm. Since you find out how old that that part started within you. And then you show, oh well in the meantime, I've done this, 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 and I've met a panther, I've met a hippopotamus, and oh come and meet them. And you start that conversation. 
and that isolator becomes a little more confident about coming out and allowing us to do what we previously couldn't do because we were constrained by that cave or whatever it is um, you're constrained by. Yes, and also the, some of these protector parts seem very uh, unattractive and don't imagine that they could belong to the community of you. So that the, the, the beginning of the integration feels so lovely. And that's that's the, the shadow. That's yeah. immediately the shadow. If you don't believe they belong to you, they be, they are the shadow. Yeah. And that's that's I suppose primarily the the most I've gained from working with my inner animals is their encouragement of me into my shadow. Amazing, mm. amazing. And I have long ago I made a dance called Embrace the Shadow oh, because yes. at the time I was reflecting a lot about it mm. and realizing that within the shadow is power, creativity, vitality, spontaneity, so many things that we've learned not to really show or embody yes. because it doesn't feel safe. Yes. And then where are they? So within that whole area that might seem a little scary and unknown is so much strength. And that's where the animals come in because they lead yeah. us so gently in there. Yeah. With such deft and and kindness and um, sensitivity, compassion. They're adorable. Mm. <laughs> and and I like. I mean, I, I was really surprised when I started doing these sessions with you. I'd done long ago voice dialogue, which I found very useful. Mm. It it, um, it was about long before people were talking about parts work. It was mm. another way in, mm. but. I didn't find any playfulness in it, no. and you do invite that element of both. Sometimes you've invited me or us to to find a place that feels very nurturing, like a lovely pond, and dwell there with some animals of your choice. And Absolutely. sometimes we've had playtime with the animals. So it's as if yeah. it's not all about the serious business of integrating. It's like you yeah. do get the nurturing. Absolutely, and that's what's so interesting because sometimes whenever you point a, um, a spotlight on the inner child, they go what, and they're out of there like in a panic. <laughs> but if you create a lovely safe space with lots of wonderful animals doing all sorts of interesting things in a beautiful garden, then the little kid, your little kid, will kind of peep around. The, the tree, go, what's going mm. on here? And they will come out voluntarily while they're not being seen or being, you know, pointed at. And that frivolousness, that fun, that joy can be started. And you can, and that is the beginnings of working with your inner child. So if somebody watching this feels a connection, feels, well, I wonder that could be interesting to me or it could be helpful to me. Um, they may be living anywhere in the world, we're yes. not, this is an international project. Mm -hmm. So um, what might be the first step to find out more? Well yes, um, uh, it's very simple to do, I mean contacting you or contacting me would be the first step. Organising a Zoom meet up and just very gently stepping into that visualising world. As I said before, I first of all build a tree grow a tree and then I, I often go to the um, to a flower at your heart and from there I move you to a doorway and behind the door is the animal of your heart. Sometimes that can be difficult to see as you said. I had one lady and she just didn't see any animal. We went through mm. the first visualization and I said I know you didn't see anything but did you feel anything and, she, and I said well how about if you close your eyes and do that now. So she, she literally put out her physical hand and went and she goes um, I feel fur and just what went through my head was big fur or little fur <laughs> and she went big fur and I said I think that's a bear and she said it is and I said so give your bear a hug and she literally <laughs> wrapped her own arms around herself and from then the joy in her work was just amazing mm. so there are many ways within and sometimes if you don't see an animal, you just have to accept and allow the animal to come and make itself known to you through perhaps dreams. Mm. In the night you mm. might wake up and suddenly there's an animal sitting next to you. So you're saying, in a way, don't put pressure on yourself to come up with some result. But it's just an invitation and it happens in its time. That's fine too, because there were two little boys who came to um, a children's workshop I did. And the elder boys, I asked what animal he had and I said, I have a panda bear. 
and the younger boy said, oh yes, I've got a pound of bear book too. And I thought, oh, right, okay. So I sat them down and I, they did the little visualisation, a little five minute short one. And, and so I asked them both and I said, so what animal did you see? And sure enough, the elder one said, I saw a panda. I said, so what animal did you see? Looking at his younger brother. And he said, I saw a panda too. And a possum. <laughs> and I got him. And I said, well, how about making a mask, claws, a tail, and ears of your heart's animal? And he goes, okay, yes, all right. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the elder boy made a panda and the younger boy made a wonderful person. <laughs> so you see, even though your mind might be telling you one thing, mm -hmm. when you go up to that door, you can't see what's behind it. Mm -hmm. And that allows your subconscious to create whatever animal is most appropriate for you. You can manufacture as he did, he saw his panda, mm. but behind it was his possum. Mm. And it might take a day, it might take three months, but ultimately the more of this work you do, the right animal will arrive. So I've got a few things that, that came to me as you're saying that. Mm. Firstly, um, just for people to know, that one of the lovely things about using animal Im imagery is it works well with with most children oh, yes. and it's not always easy to know how to approach working with children who've been through traumatizing times or maybe still going through them this is a, this is one avenue i think that's very accessible mm -hmm. and very attractive to them in terms of holding interest mm -hmm. another thing is that the sessions can be anything from five minutes to uh, unba oh, unbounded <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and I've had sessions with groups, sometimes five or ten minutes, that I found valuable. They may contain one insight or one lovely connection. And I've had one-to-one -one sessions with Jess, and you'll witness this like a short version soon on the next video, um, where we, we've set a rough time agenda, but we've allowed it to extend if it wants to extend. Because there's so much, there may be just so much time in your day, or there may be just so much that you feel you can absorb in one go and make use of and integrate. Mm -hmm. But I've really appreciated having this slightly flexible an hour to an hour and a half type yes. format and then see what's actually needed in the moment. The timing is always um, initiated by the, the, um, the person going through the journey. Obviously if they only have an hour, they only have an hour and so that's when it, we clock off. Mm -hmm. But if we give their animals free reign, they will come to a very natural end, and it is usually 90 minutes. And it's nice to have a chance to thank your animals, yeah, to sort of yes. enjoy them and say goodbye to them for now, and that sort of thing, as if, because they become, as, as I, I hear when you speak, they become presences. They, mm, yeah. they don't exist independently because they're, they're all parts of us that are all related, but they, they do seem, in some ways it helps to see them as if they were independent because each aspect of us has its own wisdom, its own voice that, it, that needs to be heard. Yes, well, when Stephen does uh, do his training, he initially introduces you to every sh uh, chakra's animal. Mm. Chakra being the spinning wheel from the um, Indian tradition. Is these. Uh, um, energy, vortex. energy vortexes, thank you, <laughs> yes. And they linked to our endocrine system. Ah, yeah. Didn't know that. So you've got the crown chakra, the brow chakra, the throat chakra, the heart chakra, the solar plexus chakra, the sacral chakra, and the root chakra. And these animals we first find. So we find sort of what's kind of going on bodily with what, what we do, although that isn't a an important element of it. It's just finding this chakra, this animal, and then working with them. Yeah. Nothing's more sort of specific than that. And then um, Steve goes on to um, working then in relationships. So we find um, uh, our, how we work in relationship with others. It, uh, it's, uh, we go also to the senses. So we find the animal of seeing, the animal of hearing, the animal of, of touch. And that was the one I found the hardest that I've ever done. Touch. Yes, because it took me back to my brain hemorrhage mm. very swiftly. And I found a shark there. <laughs> Not the uh, teeth first. <laughs> uh, but it, it was an important animal for me to, to recognise because touch for me has been very difficult because I've obviously had uh, scalpels, um, needles, but also a drill. 
going through my skull. Mm. And these things aren't easy. And obviously, this is where the PTSD, my post-traumatic stress, um, started. So that was a big, big journey for me within. Um, I don't want to make this too long, but I'm no. so fascinated that a shark would relate to touch because it's like the last animal yes, I want to touch. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, I mean, I have a lovely story. Whenever they, they obviously had to shave my hair, and I had mm. long, long hair, and um, they came in and they were attempting to, sh to shave my hair, and I went ballistic. Ah. I went all over the show. Yeah. They had to bring in two ward orderlies to hold me down <sighs> while they shaved my head. And when I was journeying with this, a lynx arrived. And my lynx is the animal of touch. My shark is the animal of, of they're, they're similar, but then my, my animal of touch was uh, a lynx. And he came over to me and he started to lick my head. Oh. And I went, oh, that feels strange. And he says, so what does it feel like? And I thought, well, it's, it's wet and soggy and it's rough. And he said, well, what does it remind you of? And I was immediately taken back to having my head shaved. Mm. And he said, was that horrible? Was that bad? Was that nasty? And I kind of went, no. And he said, so why are you still frightened of having your head shaved? And I went, oh, okay. Um, I don't think I am anymore. <laughs> he went, good. <laughs> <laughs> so simple. And he used that idea of touch. He took me back to what it felt like and gave me this wonderful soggy image of mm. having my, my head uh, licked by um, this wonderful lynx's huge lovely tongue. It was wonderful. Well I'm going to throw in something um, and then probably we'll, we'll finish off this one because we have got the chance of doing a second interview. Um, I got to know Jess because she's written a children's book which, is, which she then converted into a children's play and produced and directed um, and I was the musician in the play and that's how I came to know and the play is all about uh, a girl who's ill who meets an elephant who strengthens her her will and her self-knowledge and takes her on a jungle journey to meet other animals and find all her all her capacities and strengths to get through this tough time um, and I was very touched by the story, and it's it's an accessible story that even a six-year-old can get a lot from. And we were able to perform to audiences from about five upwards, really, and younger, who also actually. younger, younger. who all had, got a lot yes, from it. I've even had a little eighteen-month-year-old boy oh on God. mum's lap, and he was just. <laughs> fascinated in all of us sillinesses on stage. It was wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's called The Elephant of My Heart. Mm. And it, it, it's a delightful work. So um, especially if you're a parent or grandparent, I recommend that too. It's another way in to this work, which is very gentle. And work also with trauma. It's about my first journey with my elephant of my heart. Mm. And it tells of, of my journey to uh, how I changed my opinion of my scars that crisscross my head. Yeah. And trauma is something that parents know every day. A child falling over, scraping their, their knee, that is traumatic. And it, it gives another way into that whole uh, subject. And it's a gentle, compassionate and kind way in. Mm. Yes, I like that observation because the, when trauma stays with us, it's often because it's no, it's got no place. Yeah. The child or the adult doesn't know where to express it or who would understand it, and therefore it gets held in. Yes. And if there is someone that can witness or support, it makes a world of difference. Then they can release it, let it go, and they can then step into what were problematic situations with a new sense of courage, a new sense of confidence, knowing that they won't be triggered again. Yeah, and also I, I got through that one, so what's this? Yes, you know? yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And we will um, hopefully come, come watch us on the second video and we'll go a little, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the actual process of the visualization. Yes, it's experiential, this whole process. So whatever we're saying won't make any, um, won't make any sense unless you dive in yourself. Mm, may or may not. <laughs> 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 We've got clever viewers, you yes, know. <laughs> absolutely.
<laughs> so bye for now.